Hey everybody, I um, super am uh, super excited to have my friend Natasha Knopf on here. She is um, basically like a woman extraordinaire. Uh, let me tell you like a few things about her. She um, is the founder and co-owner of Evergreen Counseling, which is a therapy, small therapy practice in the western suburbs of Chicago. She is an Enneagram enthusiast and student, and uh, we were even just talking offline before this, and I was couching away some things she was saying about Enneagram ones. Um, she is, like I said, a personal friend of mine. She's a supervisor for therapists who are wanting to clinically develop. She's a professor at a university, honestly, uh, and she's a businesswoman. So I feel like you do a little bit of everything. And the reason that we're having you on today, Natasha, is because you um, were just speaking out on um, Instagram. On Instagram, yeah, in your stories. And oh, we're just exactly telling like about this experience you had with another woman who was essentially um judging you i think is a kind way to put it um, yeah yeah but it just got us started on this conversation of your identity development as like a woman a business owner a therapist a um multi-ethnic ethnic person and kind of our racial conversation we're having right now so really um i'll turn it over to you but just to kind of we're going to talk through like your story and then just kind of like take it um, as things run. And then maybe at the end, if you have any recommendations for people, we'll like hit that there at the end. So. Absolutely. That's yeah. a good reminder. You'll have to remind me if I don't get there myself. Oh, um, I got you. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Thank you for that. First of all, thank you for that lovely intro. Um, part of my personal work over the years has been like accepting what my parts used to call compliments and would kind of like brush them off. Like, Oh no not like false humility, but a sense of like, I don't deserve praise for work. Sure. Hard work is work. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if I know it, maybe it's not uh, work. Yeah. I think maybe a lot of your viewers, especially if you're a business owner, I think a woman too, there's a lot about how we have been socialized to internalize what work means in the body and the mind, how it's supposed to feel. So I just want to say thank you for the intro. And it's helpful for me to hear just kind of like um, a brief overview of all the work I've done. Um, especially in reference to this conversation today, how yeah, you know, it's great to uh, receive that from you, but also to like unpack it more. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, Natasha, I'm sure it actually doesn't uh, hit on everything that you do. Like, I'm sure I could keep going. And you know, I think that you and I have had kind of, in a way, some fun. Like, um, we've been on like a parallel process with identity development because, like, we started our businesses around the same time. We both started therapy practices around the same time. We both kind of went to the same. What was that? We graduated at the same time. So. We graduated the same year from grad school in two different programs. Exactly. So I feel like we're on a similar track um, so, for sure. Totally. Yeah. And if I can summarize that too, I, I should say like as of today, you know, uh, end of June, 2020, obviously this year has been monumental for everyone <laughs> on the planet, really. Um, I think that the, the work that I'd like to talk about today about um, the, the Instagram story you saw me post, my comments about it, really have to do with um, what it is to be a woman in the world, right? And that's a pretty broad label, I admit. But how does that intersect with perhaps a small business owner? Um, also me as a therapist, helper, healer. Um, also as a Christian, there is that identity I hold. Um, and I have led with at different times, but it's, it's changed its place for me. Um, and also there's um, definitely some like, so uh, I identify as mixed race. Um, I also say white passing because <laughs> I think I do. You do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And how the, all those intersect. But well, I think we'll lead with maybe like a female identity business owner and what that means. And then um, some other work that I've been doing, which is just a lot. So we'll try to pare it down. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just kind of talk about my social media use just to give people who are listening um, um, some context. So I've like been pretty silent. I mean, social media for me has been, let's uh, just, you know, show my relatives or my friends what I'm cooking or what I'm eating or I don't know, maybe what I'm reading occasionally. Um, but my use has just been so casual. But there's something in me that I, I, I talk in parts. I think, you know, whoever's listening will also know that by now but there's been a part of me that's been like you know what just keep that stuff off social media I mean let's just not share things but there I mean arguably with um, systemic oppression and how that's being overturned right now people are using voices 
um, sharing things, educating themselves and others. I think that's kind of the spirit that I engaged in to start to talk. And I'm like, you know what? I might as well start sharing things because um, I think truth is really personal, right? Mm -hmm. Like the truth that we come to and the truth that I share with people tends to be tied to me. Um, the work I've done, the experiences I've had, um, I think are important. So I, it's, this has been a culmination of a lot of over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. So I figured I would just post on like create mode on Instagram and just type a bunch of thoughts, which you saw. Yep. And also later I started taking pictures of things and then like posting on them. I'm trying to make them cute because <laughs> that's half the fun. But uh, I had an experience where that you, Alex, saw and you, you know, a lot of your parts kind of came to attention and were interested. But I had an experience of, uh, it was a beautiful day. I mean, right now it's, it was storming here in Wheaton, but it was a beautiful day. And uh, part of my work has been to become less of a hard worker and more into self-care. So I've been taking walks. So I was taking a walk outside. It was on the Prairie Path in Illinois. Uh, if you live here, you know what that is. I was like, it's so close to my house. I'm just going to start walking. Um, I also have been doing work again. So this is the layers of my work. So one layer is being a workaholic. I do call myself a former workaholic. So I'm like, I'm going to take a walk before I do any work because that's important. My body is important. Yeah. So I'm going to take a walk. And then also I've used to edit myself. Um, just really quickly, like I used to, and I think a lot of women can identify with this. Yeah. We are very socialized from a young age to tune into different parts of our bodies, parts that are appealing to others, sexy, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, parts that appeal to probably like a male gaze. Yep. Um, and then also parts that maybe feel less than, we try to improve and all of that. And there's a whole conversation about women's bodies and what feminism has taught us. And all. I don't want to go there, but I at least <laughs> want to talk about it's an important conversation, but I want to talk about myself in that. Mm -hmm. So like for me, I was raised very much with, I think, patriarchy and Catholicism. So like my mom was very much about like modesty. I think a lot of people raised in like Catholic or Christian homes, modesty, or perhaps not, um, not showing things when you're not supposed to show them um, to other people, parts of your body was really important. So, um, in the last year, I've been like, you know, I really want to think about where the burden of work is for people. Uh, like, you know, is my burden supposed to be covering up my rear yeah. or my front or whatever you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, other people might look at it and might have sexual feelings or it might look sexualized to them or, or am I attracting things? I mean, I can go on and on about all the thoughts. Are you attention seeking? Are you causing yeah, attention seeking? And Exactly. Is this proper? Is this okay? Or honestly, like rape culture in there too, we'll throw that. Like women also being told like you're asking for certain types of attention or boundary violations. But let's just call that wrong. Outward. Yeah, wrong. Like yeah, exactly. I think yeah. that people will understand that from yeah. our conversation, but it's like no way is no that way. ever, no matter how you're dressed. That no. Is okay. Exactly. Wrong. Not and also way. Yeah, and I'll say this, like as a business owner as a therapist, as a supervisor, as someone who like, I honestly like, own the hard work I've done, the status or the identities I hold, right? And then people would hear that as you introduce me, maybe think like, oh, Natasha's probably done a lot of work. She might be mentally healthy, emotionally healthy, feel free. And so yeah, I, I do think I've done work for many years. Mm -hmm. But it was really, it's been striking to me to see even how there's parts of me that still have internalized toxic messages. So. So I was like, you know, I'm going to wear this workout outfit that Natasha two years ago probably would have been like, oh, that's a little too much. A little too revealing. A little too revealing or whatever, <laughs> you know, a little too something. Um, and so I was like, you know, I'm just going to put it on. I'm going to wear it because it's comfortable. You know, I think to pause you really quick, I think that too much language is a, is a, is a female. It's a female thing. It's a female thing, a female language. You don't you don't, I think occasionally and maybe in a different way, but yeah. in my, in my personal and professional relationships, I really don't hear men talk about I'm too much in the same oh. way that women do and women tone themselves down. So I think yeah. even just like you being like, it's too much of something too much tunes into that, that idea. Yeah, absolutely. And just, it doesn't even have to be revealing or this or that or the other. It's just too much, you know? Yeah. It's just, I mean, to digress a little bit, like I think the Me Too movement highlighted this on social media and in everyone's minds, but women have, we've always known, generations, even you know, millennial and Gen Z, maybe Gen Z is a little different, but um, 
women are always told that there's something too much, even not with those, with those words, right? Um, yeah, I'm sure people listening can also just remember, you know, being very young, you get attention from typically men. I mean, catcalling's a thing, yeah. you know, and, and not to justify it. I don't want to play into the two, there's too much or too little, but honestly, it doesn't matter what you're wearing, what you look like. It's more about the objectification of the female versus the actual clothing. Yeah. It's a systemic problem versus an individual burden. And so that's what I'm working through. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I'm going to put on, you know, whatever outfit I want and I don't really care. And I don't want to think a lot about it. Mm -hmm. I want to lift that burden off of my mind and my body. So I was walking. Um, and so I took a walk. It was like 25 minute walk. Um, and it was very interesting. I got this reaction. And I wrote about this in the story and I broke it down, if you remember. So I was on the prairie path and I'm walking and I'm having a great time. And I do know that old Natasha was very controlled. Um, yeah, and not in a bad way. I don't like, I'm not, I'm not saying she was a bad person. She was just doing the best with what she had. And, you know, I would have probably kept to myself or like, I don't know, just like literally kept my body in a very safe position, right? Yeah, the posture, again, the too much message, or the toxic message women take in is like, you have to control yourself all the time unless, you know, something happens or you're too out of control or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was having fun. I was like taking selfies of myself, taking videos of bees. <laughs> you know, like I, I definitely know with having a healthy sense of self that I'm coming off as a very happy person in that moment. And I think that's healthy for all of us to, to determine that, you know, not that I felt burdened to, but that was organically who I was. Mm -hmm. So walking around, there's, um, there was a couple women, they had young children with them when they were walking up the path. And I'm looking away, and then in my line of sight, I turn, and the woman, in, she's in, she's in leading them. She, I, I look at her face, and I turn to smile, because that's a new thing that I do. <laughs> For the work I've done, I'm happy in public. <laughs> so I turn to smile at her, but immediately before I got to smile, I noticed that her face registered disgust. Like it had what you're doing right now. It was like, mm, it was like a pursed mouth. Um, her eyes were narrowed. And I honestly was shocked, first of all. And then another part of me, I think it's that uh, internalized patriarchy, uh, these toxic messages that tell women and gaslight them and tell them like, oh, what you're seeing is not true, right? I definitely felt the part of me go, oh no, Natasha. Like this woman's not looking at you. I was the only person on the path, first of all. <laughs> She was only looking at me. There wasn't, I had no companion. So, I mean, that's kind of illogical, but you can hear the like, um, use this phrase, brainwashing that I go through, that women go through. And I was like, oh no, no, she's not doing that to me. But then I noticed that as, so that's a split second. So that's second two, first shock, then no, you're not seeing what you're seeing. And then number three was I smiled. So I finally registered a smile and she goes, like a shocked smile. Like, I think, you know, I mean, people, we all have the experience. If you're looking at someone, you smile, they'll smile. Like it's a human reaction, but it did disprove that second voice that came in and said, you're not seeing what you're seeing mm. because she was locked on me. Mm. And my smile in a nonverbal way communicated to her, I'm smiling at you. What are you going to do with your face? Yeah. <laughs> and she smiled and then like passed. And then I'll say like those three parts or that multiplicity of experience kept playing in my mind as I'm walking home. And I, you know, parts of me like, you know, you didn't see that you're too sensitive. Another part that's like, you know, maybe, maybe you're making it up, Natasha. Maybe you're looking for opportunities to be um, calling other women out and on and on, right? Just questioning myself. Um, but with the work I've done, um, also being a therapist, like practicing what I preach, I do know that we can read other people. Absolutely. Well. Nonverbals are a huge part of communication. Yeah. I do know, being a resident of Wheaton for many years, uh, that women, I mean, there's a large Christian presence here. Mm -hmm. Not to say, I, like I said, I identify with that, I lead with that identity. Yeah. Um, and I know that w women are socialized to be modest and we tend to police each other, which I do want to talk about. Um, yeah, I just know that there's many reasons why I think my presence might have been uh, listening to a reaction from her. So yeah. I chose to say this is real and it's not necessarily like a personal thing. Personal mean like, I don't know her. I wish her the best. <laughs> well, you know, it's reminding, me of, Go ahead. it's reminding me of two things. I think first of all, even just mm -hmm. like when it comes to like trust, like 
I don't think that women very often trust themselves or trust their gut. Oh. And it's kind of like you know, when we lead from that, like, I mean, just neuroscience has shown more and more that like our emotional mm -hmm. center of our brain is actually what interprets and that it is always scanning and reading micro expressions. But then yeah. also, like our gut is actually like the second most concentrate, concentrated place of like nerve endings. So when you mm -hmm. have a gut response, um, it actually, and you know, I feel like a, a feminine leadership, a feminine creativity is often like intuition. Not that men can't have that, but I think that men and no. women both have a continuum of masculine and feminine femininity, yeah. but t intuition is kind of more of a feminine. It is. Historically, absolutely. There has been a divide. Yeah. Ex implicitly or both between masculine knowledge being logic in the head and the mind assertive forward motion yeah and certainty based on fact and scientific inquiry and scientific yeah yep. right and that's our, that's our school system from a young age but then feminine knowledge has been like what's left over feelings um kind of a gut sense that's why they have phrases like women's intuition mm -hmm. or a mother knows you know that phrase which um, I do think that there is an intelligence there, but isn't it interesting that even you highlighted that um, I've been socialized to devalue that? Oh, that can't be true. Yeah, it's really actually Absolutely. So then in that experience, I'm drawing on so much wisdom and so much knowledge, but then there's, there's still, even to this day, who I am and what I've done, um, is still, there's a part of me that is so intrinsically tied into that toxic messaging and the division between masculine and feminine knowledge it's like mm -mm, no right. I don't know that those are just feelings and impressions mm -hmm. I know that part if I let it run wild it'd be like you haven't talked to her you don't know her why would she look at you in disgust but then when I'll say like just to reference this this is what's helped me to speak out about this female experience or really what we're talking about today is that the the, the discourse online right that's uh that's helping to educate white people people in power about privilege and microaggressions and how things are systemic right they're passed down and the system becomes personal and we are a part of the system mm -hmm. right Help, helps me in that moment to write that story and to really be like you know what um the systems that i know that affect me have affected that woman we're in this together and that is why i know what she's done because i've also done that to other women right? Yeah. Um, I do want to reference, I guess, um, talking about like flipping the scripts to help me get my knowledge, right, about those women. So, you know, there's that masculine, feminine knowledge parts of me that we're battling. But I will say, so I'm, I've been reading a lot of bell hooks, and this is something we can reference at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so if you haven't read bell hooks, Google her right now, get her books. Um, specifically right now, I'm reading all about love, and then teaching to, tran to transgress, I just bought. But in All About Love, Bell Hooks talks about a definition of love. Mm -hmm. um, she's, it's basically a meditation on love, but it does talk about different facets. Like, what is it? Is it a feeling or is it an action? Or both, right? So there's a wide breadth and depth that she goes into about love. But she talks about m men and women. And Bell Hooks is a feminist author. She uh, she's, talks about intersectionality, right? She's black. Um, so she talks about multiple identities and intersectional feminism and really just to reference her she talks about how the patriarchy has hurt men and women in yep. different ways yep. and then she'll talk about power and all that so that's kind of a side comment but she makes comments in the book repeatedly about how specifically with power women have been divided from men in knowledge divided from men in power and divided from men in how they get love so she makes these wonderful comments in the book uh, early on, the second chapter or something about how, and they struck me, and this is what I remembered in that moment. She talked about how gossiping is something that women were, uh, are always told that we do. Like women gossip, men don't gossip. And then in the church, to throw in another one of my identities, gossip is a sin, right? And women, and, and not to get too into it, but I've been told explicitly, implicitly, that if I have a comment about someone on the side, it's gossip, when it's not. <laughs> Or if it is, um, Bell Hooks talks about that. She says, I'll just summarize her, I can't quote her, but she talks about how women, because we can't use our power overtly, we use it covertly. So a look of disgust in terms of what Bell Hooks, I think is teaching me or I'm learning from her. Number one, I can know it, 
because I'm intuitive and that's knowledge and that's truth. But then number two, because women are told to keep our aggression inside, we're told to keep, you know, any sort of really any thought or feeling or sentiment besides being nice, since it has to be covert, uh, we can have aggression towards each other and ourselves that is very hidden. Um, you know, there was this interesting, uh, I think I might've cut you off on a thought. Were you going to say? No, no. Oh yeah. I was gonna, yeah. I was just going to tie that in and say that um, uh, it's just very normal. If you, also, if you grew up in the church or if you just Super are normal. socialized as a woman, it's very normal to have side conversations about people. And not that it's, I'm not going to say it's right or wrong, but not a moral discussion, but I'm just saying that that was a factor for me and like going like, Oh no, we do that to each other. And I've done that. Oh, we judge each other all the time. And it really is systemic oppression of women that has caused us to do that. It is so easy for us. Yeah. Well, you know, it's reminding me of, well, so something that really gets me is almost seeing like um, female on female bullying or, yeah. I don't really know what other word to use besides bullying. And I'm pulling that out because um, there was a really interesting article in the Atlantic years ago that was talking about women bullying each other in the workplace. And, oh. And they gave a few different reasons why that is, but um, in in our more masculine and corporate, I would say, um, American system, there's probably a man would see like an infinite number of spaces at the top, you know, like mm -hmm. there's, there's always room at the top for him. Whereas women, and this is kind of interesting, like business owner to business owner is like, women are kind of like, oh, there's a limited number of spaces at the top. Let's say there's only two and there's 20 of us women that work here. So we actually need to compete with each other to make it there. And it's just like, you know, I know scarcity mentality is such a buzzword. But yes, it, it is. Thankfully, people know it, but. <laughs> yes, but it's essentially, I think that um, the system of oppression, the patriarchy, you know, misogyny, which you were kind of like, it hurts men and women. It's like that devaluing of the feminine in both, in us all, all men, all women. But really yeah, are the, the covert power and the scarcity yeah. combines to make those things happen. Yeah, exactly. And right. we compete against each other. Uh -huh. instead of yes. like, we totally see each other as the first target. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on many levels, if, if anyone listening like has identified with being Christian, being female, being a business owner, right? So in like more of a competitive field or whatever, mm -hmm. you're going to get it at some point. I don't think anyone listening would be like, nope, it's never happened to me or I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. It is so normal for women to first target each other. I mean, we target ourselves too. Let's yeah. talk about internal aggression, but we target each other as like peers. I think also too, to throw this in there, because we're not socialized to see men as peers. Hmm. Right. I mean, boys, it's the same. I don't think boys see women as peers in certain levels. And yeah, there's little leagues and sometimes little kids want to be, um, I think it's okay to put them into sometimes like gender specific groups for different reasons. But then part of me questions that. <laughs> but children are so divided on gender and then they're socialized a different way. It's true. It's sad. Women are like pitted against each other. It's really quite terrible. I also say, I'll say this too, like another piece of work I've been doing along scarcity or even knowing like, or wondering why that's a thing. Um, yeah. And how that plays into me is, is uh, so I'll back up. So a year ago, I was thinking, you know, I really would like some business guidance. I'd like a coach or I'd like a class or some type of, some type of program, right? Um, and, and there's a lot out there. There is an abundance, if I want to use that word, of knowledge for business owners, right? Small business owners. And, and there's like coaches targeted toward helping you perform in this way or helping you do that. I mean, we live in America. There's an abundance of products. For whatever problem you have, you can find like 100 things or more. <laughs> right? It's very capitalist, right? Opportunity to make money. So I get that the field is like that. So I had that in my mind and things that I kept encountering, things being just products, right? Like a program that I could do on my own, a coach I can work with, uh, a business school for entrepreneurs, whatever you want to say, was um, really use the same language, very masculine about power, performance, product, output, um, anything else you want to add to that list, but it's about productivity, it's about uh, maximizing profit. It's about more, 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 more. Again, to contrast that with women being too much, it's very masculine. It's generativity. Mm -hmm. So men are raised to be big and to take up space and yeah. all, right? And, and really, honestly, all that equals success. Truly. The bottom line, 
what, yeah, truly what I took away was that success is to be masculine in all these ways and to produce and to work hard in a masculine sense. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that's how I feel like I've operated my business. Personally, I can say, I guess I can speak for the system too, but more personally, the way I've run Natasha has been from a solely masculine without a feminine balance. Of like working long hours. Um, I should say, I think I definitely got burned out the first year because for me, success was so tied to hard work. And if you're working hard, you know, you're doing a good job. And if you're doing a good job, then you're going to have a successful business. And that's how it follows, right? Um, but illogically, the outcome was I was run to the ground. So, I, so knowing that and then approaching like the business world or the business development product world, there was a part of me, my inner wisdom was like, you know what? We need something different. We don't need to know all the things that honestly I've suffered under. Perhaps it's time for a revolution. So I found through probably Instagram showed it to me, the algorithm I think has intelligence. <laughs> but um, I found um, Jennifer Armbrust's work. She um, owns her company's called Sister. And it's, uh, she is a coach, she's an entrepreneur herself, and her passion and purpose and really pleasure in life, those are her words, mm -hmm. or, she, or she teaches all those things together, passion and power, and, or sorry, passion, purpose, and pleasure, is to help women, people identify as women, um, really grow into an abundance mindset. I mean, she talks about so many things. I feel like I'm reducing her, honestly, that she's that good. <laughs> But she really, look, or one of the, one crux of her work is moving from the masculine economy to the feminine economy. So basically, if we think of the feminine as being devalued, as you and I have kept saying, devalued and divided from masculine ways of being in the world and really success, if we recover those things and integrate them into our business practices and our personal lives, what's possible? And really said that in a positive way, what's possible for the world. So I enrolled in the sisterhood, which as a founding member, and it's an online community, we are on Slack and we get emails twice a month with activities and exercises that are really anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchy, anti-toxic um, masculinity, anti-burnout. Um, and that's been a great resource for me and an eye opener of how many ways I have internalized the masculine, um, for better or worse. Um, I say that just to give my past self, you know, some grace, <laughs> but how I've internalized it and really only tried to survive on that. Um, and I'll just give a quick example so you get a sense and maybe you want to join or buy one of her other products because she is like an entrepreneur, has classes and um, she has published work. But the first lesson was about pleasure. So, I mean, already you can tell that the course on business is very different than anything else versus now knowing your KPIs, which are key performance indicators um or talking about ideal client like those things are great tools but they don't feed my soul i don't think they feed anyone's soul man or woman or otherwise but immediately i was struck with and i think i even teared up doing the first exercise because it's about pleasure it was about asking yourself when do you where do you feel pleasure there's like a there's an embodied kind of somatic exercise but then she writes and has questions and you get to reflect and really engage with the material but her the thesis, if I want to call it that, of the first exercise was um, your job is, or sorry, no one else can have pleasure for you. It's your job alone, right? Um, which I say is anti-capitalist because capitalism will tell you you should buy this product to feel pleasure <laughs> or look what I've created because this is pleasurable for you, even though I don't know you. <laughs> yeah. But it was very much about centering my business in my body and my body in my business centering my passion and my you know pleasure in my business and vice versa um and it was just really it was an eye-opener it's hard to describe the magnitude of shift i felt um, but i think one of the questions just to give you a sense was um i'm not giving away your material it's just like to reference part of it yeah. but one uh, one question was um it basically was the question of um like can your ego Ego meaning like your sense of self and your sense of power and how you are in the world, your defenses. Can your ego let go of the idea that hard or sorry, that work has to be hard, right? Or that hard work or good work is devoid of pleasure, which I've said many times because I'm referencing it now. Um, but I would love people listening to ask that, like to what degree or a part of work in your life do you think, oh, I've done a good job because it's not been fun. It's been hard. 
and how we even congratulate each other. Like, wow, you worked hard. Look at you building your business, right? And I know you, when you introduced me, you weren't, you know, I didn't feel that from you. you like we've had conversations off screen, so we know like how hard it's been for us. Oh, gosh, <laughs> but I share, yeah, gosh, but I share that to like encourage other business owners, women especially of like, you know, just continue doing the work, right? And like I said, I, I, I'm trying to be humble and stay on the path and believe that like we're never there. Um, and specifically women in the world and women in business definitely need to think about how they intersex. How has your, your identity as a woman, where you've operated, how are you, how are you going to take that to the business world and, and, and how it's very personal and we need to rethink that. Well, and I, so I'm all about the well, gospel think, of, of doing this work. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I just think yeah. that the business world, just like I think the world in general actually needs um, leading from a place of feminine infused back into it. Because yes. There is yes. That, that nurturing, that life, that vitality energy that I think comes from the feminine side. And, you know, I, I'm really going to have to look up um, some of these things that you've like mentioned just because I, I, mm -hmm. I am unfamiliar with them. And I think I would probably resonate with a lot of them, but I think even oh. um, for those people like in Chicago, I know that this group like works on a, at least a national level, if not like an international level, but I was telling you about, there's an organization in Chicago called Women's Leadership Lab, and they're yeah, you said they're amazing. And there's these three women, and essentially they run. There's a little bit of a curriculum, but it's more kind of um, women's circles where we just continue to talk about like the what it means to be woman, what it means to be woman in like the world in a masculine environment in a misogynistic environment, and. Um, I, I could not speak highly enough about my experience with them. I could not. Mm. I'm going to do it again. Time and time. So. I will say from what you've told me, well, obviously you experience Women's Leadership Lab. I'm experiencing um, the, the sisterhood or sister, which is Jennifer, Jennifer Armbrust's work. But um, I do think that they will not compete at all. <laughs> Those two things, like I need to cross over to you, you need to cross over to me. I think so. Yeah, but, but it's definitely like these resources are places where feminine knowledge, feminine ways of like being, which women have known for millennia, are being translated or being highlighted. The implicit knowledge we have is being made explicit and is being infused with what's already here. Because I will say like Jennifer's work, and I'm sure the Women's Leadership Lab is not anti-success. It's not anti-abundance or it's not anti like you make a good product, you make a good living, like, you know, that's, those are good things. But it is a like, redefinition it's a deconstruction of what you thought and then it's a reintroduction it's so sad to think of reintroduction but it is it's a reintroduction of feminine ways of being thinking feeling and doing in the world um yeah it, it's wonderful work mm. were you gonna say something yeah i was just even thinking that it's like even in this conversation um you know not to kind of and that like a devaluing of masculine because I also think that that's an important yes. energy in the world but just like kind of what you were saying on the top of this like conversation about like systems of oppression you know and where has um obviously you know and I would really actually love for you to talk about like some of your multi-ethnic identity or like white oh, yeah. but I just think that um, there is we need to learn to equally value both and right now it's oh. And it's um, imbalanced pretty drastically to value yeah. the masculine way of being in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there is, and I'll say Bell Hooks's work. Well, I haven't read all of her stuff, but uh, her work at large is about the balance. And really that we're kind of like historically the world mm -hmm. right now, if you and I are using the word reintroduction and balance and like deconstruction, it's because we're in the process of balancing. We're not there yet. Where I think some people might hear that and go like, oh, okay, then you're supposed to throw out the masculine. It's like, no, that's a scarcity mindset. If anything, we're just asking for more, mm -hmm. not remove one, add the one, and then we're at zero sum again. No, this is a moment of recovery of the feminine in everyone, yep. but then not at the devaluing of the masculine. If anything, then it's a revision of what is masculinity in the world versus toxic things like patriarchy. Yeah. <laughs> right? So funny because it's like I, the I would say I have a lot of masculine energy in me and it was reminding me of a date I was on it ended up being our last date with this guy 
and he no my he was noticing my last name which is hair which actually mm -hmm. it's german it's like got a lot of roots in german um and you know whenever i talk about my ethnic identity i usually actually talk more from my mom's side which is serbian and slovakian mm -hmm. i don't usually talk mm -hmm. German side, which probably means I'm disowning a part of myself that I really need to reintegrate back into my but but he was like oh that makes sense and I was like we're sitting at breakfast it's the day before my birthday and I'm like well what do you mean that makes sense because he said it in a not a kind way and he oh. said, I know he said you're what did he say intense efficient and commanding um to like and and I, what's funny about that is I think that he was intending them to be not kind, but I actually heard that and I was like, yeah, that actually is kind of true about myself and I'm okay with it, you know? Like, obviously I don't want to run people over, but like, I think that that's just yeah. that like, even women have a masculine energy, but we need to, like you said, restore or equal mm -hmm. that also leading from a place of feminine. Yeah, absolutely. And then also allow people, then if you have access to both, like to move on that line, like you talked about this continuum of masculine and feminine, this fluidity then can be available to everyone. But really in the spirit of like reconstruction, deconstruction, this kind of revolution, we have to kind of write the scales. Like first we have to bring up the feminine and then perhaps revision the masculine. And then we can all move very safely, sustainably and freely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I, I'll say in my work, it's not as if I have become like some totally different person and super feminine. And I don't think anyone listening will hear that. But if anything, it's just more informed by masculine parts and more informed by feminine and they just help each other. It's a very reciprocal relationship. <laughs> um, oh, so I do want to throw in like you're saying a moment ago about um, talking about the intersection then of my multi-ethnic identity and how that has been also a place of me intersecting that with being female and being a Christian and a therapist. This intersectionality work is also a buzzword, but it's important. <laughs> but um, so part of my work has in recent, and recent being, you know, George Floyd's murder, and um, well, I'm, there's countless murders, right? But that's perhaps the one, and there's a discourse about why that has to be the one and all that, which I'm not going to get into. Um, but really, just like the, the collective grief and the rage and the discourse and the thinking and doing and feeling that everyone's doing, um, I thought, okay, I really need to think before I speak, but I do want to speak. Um, and I shared on Instagram, you saw the stories I shared, but my story of having a multiple identity, I feel like is perhaps in some ways has been a burden, but I'm trying to transmute it into an inheritance. Um, so I shared on my Instagram, I'll give a very truncated version for the audience, but so I was raised, or my mom is from Peru. She's an immigrant, came here when she was seven. And all of my relatives on my mom's side, um, or my relatives in that generation, so my aunts and uncles and my grandparents were born in Peru. Actually, sorry, one aunt was born, the youngest of my mom's siblings is born in the U.S. <clears throat> um, but very much, my family has an immigrant story. Um, and then... My dad's side, he's white, he's white American, and they've been here for a long time, but they're German. We have that overlap too, but been here for generations. And when I was young, um, you know, school, I'll say this, is a huge factor in socializing children um, to think about everything, to gender, race, sexuality, um, religion to some degree, when religion is schools, whatever. I mean, it socializes kids dramatically. And I was raised, um, but then my mom encouraged us to read when we were young. Like we had that in our household, like learning was important. But um, I do have, have clear memories. And I know that this is not how it's done now um, because I've been asked teachers recently, but they don't really divide kids in the way that I was divided, at least in my school district. So I was selected to be a gifted and talented education student. They called it GATE. And we were taken out of classes regularly to do extracurricular things where they had more time, money, and resources to give us. And they chose, I see you're shaking your head. They chose us based on our test scores and our tests, our standardized tests and other things. And we scored highly because we were all white kids. Like, honestly, it was white kids. And then there were also some Asian kids. There's mostly Korean, but we had some Chinese because that, that's what my hometown is like. Um, but basically children that were socialized very young to have a lot of resources. My mom, you know, put me through things. My dad is a native English speaker. 
So I acquired the language very well. So of course I'm gonna do good on tests, of course. Whereas like classmates that I got along with, I played with at recess, because I was grew up in Southern California, they had parents that were from Mexico. So their first generation themselves, or some of those kids are were from Mexico. Um, but they did not have the same language acquisition, so that's going to translate into how they perform. So I didn't know it at the time. I didn't like know it, but I knew it again, my feminine knowledge. I was like, I always was like, this is weird, right? Like, this is so weird. And then also as a mixed race kid, I was like, I'm white passing, but I'm also like, I consider myself pretty dark <laughs> in some features. So I was like, but I identify with them and my mom's family's a lot like them. We speak Spanish at home or I hear it. But then I can also speak, I can speak English really well. It was just confusing, right? But in my adult knowledge, I look back and I'm like, that was pretty screwed up. <laughs> like there was already, I think it was, a, there was already like an overabundance of resources given to kids that were already perhaps ahead. Where I think nowadays, I think in 2020, people can hear that story and go like, yeah, that probably wasn't the best. Maybe there should have been an equal distribution or something, right? Um, and I do see that though as like setting me up for success now because it then leveraged me year after year to getting more attention. Even just the, besides the knowledge I got good attachment from teachers, they paid attention to me because I was smart, <laughs> right? Smart on a particular level. Social what? Social yeah, exactly. Social capital. capital, yeah. Totally. I could like do well on tests. I could be very well behaved. I would say culturally too, like, I mean, not to get too much into this, but like the parts of me that are very like Latina that are from my mom's family, with Peruvians and people who are perhaps, you know, Latin relatives or no, or Hispanic know this, but like, there's a different way of relating. Um, and I knew how to perhaps code switch between what I was like at home, what I was like at school. So very proper. I just know all the social cues to just put it plainly. So all of that together, it was a lot. I mean, there's layer upon layer. I'm sure memories will continue to come back to me. But then I also have memories of like classmates whose parents perhaps were not, you know, legal immigrants to this country. I put that in quotes because that language is problematic to me. But le they weren't legal immigrants, right? Or they weren't American born like my dad. So they were helping their younger siblings get ready for school. And then they couldn't bring their assignment. They came late. Like kids were suffering on a systemic level because their parents were suffering and the school was like, we don't know how to respond. I don't really actually, I should say, to be fair, I don't remember, but I do remember negative experiences of kids like getting tardies, then taken out of class. But the story was bigger than the fact that they were just late. Yeah, so all that to say, not to get too into more of the weeds of that story, but like, I do feel like my I as a person, and this is more personal development, um, I looked back at that, I wrote all this on my Instagram. I was like, there's parts of me that in 2020, adult Natasha needs to, I feel compelled, not through shame, but through this like collective grieving of like, I identified strongly with my white identity, my white passing identity, because it was helpful. Um, it got me success. It got me attention. You were it leveraged. Yeah, I was resourceful. Again, like I said earlier, Past Natasha or little Natasha in this instance needed to do that. And she felt very cared for because it was caring to give me those things. Right. Um, but so in my identity so far, I'm really working on like divesting my white parts of all this power and privilege. And not like I'm not taking a poverty vow. I'm not like, getting rid of stuff, but internal work of like grieving when I did that. And then also when I was perhaps older at different ages and could have spoken up, but didn't. Right. Or, and then also thinking forwardly, right. In the future of, so as a person that has benefited from white privilege, at least on one part of me, how can I decentralize whiteness in my business practices, in my therapy? Right. And that comes down to like marketing, maybe the images on our site need to show more racism, just whites, right. Or diversity, whatever. Um, and, and yeah, there's many ways that you can do that, but I've been working on that because that's the part of me that holds the most power. And then I know we're, you know, wrapping up or getting close to them. But then the part of me that's being recovered is my Latina parts. The parts of me are the, like the part of my identity that was definitely more hidden. Um, because that's not what I had to use in school. And i.e. it's not what I've used in work. But it is absolutely the parts of me that are waking up. And then might have been present, I'll say this, when I was on that walk. How we started this conversation. Because there is something about 
if you want to talk cultural somatics, cultural somatics is um, interesting work. I will reference it. Maybe we can put it for people in some sort of link. But I'm really recently getting into the work of um, Tada Hozumi. Um, he is Canadian. He's of Japanese descent. And he has other identities he leads with that he shares on podcasts or um, YouTube videos that he works on. But he, he does work on cultural somatics, which basically is cultures so groups of people have a soma have a felt sense about them and it is passed down in families individual to individual so anyway all that to say like there's stereotypes about like people that are you know hispanic right and we're peruvian so south america that were perhaps loud and expressive and colorful and use our voices and i do think that's true it's a stereotype when you use it to harm people right but it's not a stereotype on the level of cultural somatics where like you know at my wedding all of the guests that were screaming on the dance floor, I mean, honestly, my husband is white um, and his parents are both from America. Um, but all the people that were screaming on the dance floor and hooting and hollering all night were my Peruvian descended family members. Because that's normal for us. But I will say and own, the parts of me that have shown up at work and school um, and business ownership are very capitalist, focused on money, white, a male um, parts. So it's very interesting to me, and I don't pretend to do work on that level now or have this infused in my business, but I do have all of these questions of myself of like, how do my multiple identities inform my business, in addition to my personal life? But how can those parts of me that are Latina, which I identify as collectivists, right? They want groups to make decisions to help each other. Parts that feel like, honestly, I feel like my Latina parts are generous. No one in our house ever went hungry. We're always feeding neighbors. like everyone's your cousin when they would visit from Peru, even if they weren't your cousin, right? So I'm wondering, you know, I used to devalue those parts, or I was trained to, and I did myself. I did it to myself to some degree. To devalue those parts of the way I've showed up in the world is a process of grief. And then 2020 to 2021 or so forth, Natasha wants to think about how can those parts be allowed to be the ones that lead business decisions or lead her identity, as you said, a therapist, a supervisor, um, the business owner and so forth like how can i balance the two and not get rid of the white but how can they be those parts be friends or parts be balanced inside of me and i think yeah. i feel like i'm talking about, i know you're nodding i think you're taking it in <laughs> I, to, I think always encouraged by these type of conversations because i think that um you know a very like loose definition of health is an integrated person um, um mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of, you know, my personal therapist, he's a, he's a union analyst. So I feel like a lot of his, the shadow so side, cool. you know, um, the masculine and feminine, um, but, but really kind of an integration of all parts, um, really probably defines a lot about what I think is healthy. And probably at any point in time, if I think projection, you know, maybe just like we can end kind of mm -hmm. we'll start wrapping up the conversation, but I think projection is a really helpful tool that if people are like, where do I even start tuning into myself to figure out what parts I'm disowning, what ones I'm over utilizing, is just to kind of notice that any single person, what feels like, what about them feels like they pull you in and what about them feels like you want to push it away. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So to wrap, to tie that into my experience in the prairie path, I wrote in this story, like, you know, there was never a moment where, and I think it's perhaps a product of my work. I didn't want to harm this woman. I didn't want to give her a nasty look. I didn't. I can honestly say I didn't try to return that aggression or that relational violence. <laughs> I didn't. I was all shocked, first of all. And it was a split second. But I, I do think, like, in my heart, I didn't go there. Um, but it's interesting to me, and there's a part of me that fantasizes about how, like, I wish I could be her friend and be like, you know, or if I was her friend. You know, it'd be great for that woman to go, hey, why did something about this woman who was laughing and walking around taking pictures and honestly like exuding some type of energy that might be, you know, evidence of the work that I've done to like de-internalize toxic structures, right? What re repulsed me or sorry, repulsed her about me or what was she disgusted by? Because I honestly think that like you're saying projection, I think she, to some level parts of her wanted to do that herself. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah. Honestly, I think that they were in, in a weird way that that projection or that um, 
not projected, sorry, that disgust is perhaps the part of her that wants to invite that into herself. Mm -hmm. All right, and I'll say, I'll, I'll throw this in here too. Like, maybe this is something you felt, I don't know, because we both identify as like hard work over functioners. But, uh, or I'll tie this in here too. So I went to an Enneagram training in October. It was a short weekend with Urani Opias and um, B Chestnut. Um, and they, it was like a short weekend in Arizona. I can tell you more about it later. Um, but they talked about how for every number, but then they reference the one too, which I identify with, which is very moral, responsible, hardworking. They're like, you know, pay attention to your shadow work, which is probably the shadow of your number, which is Jungian, right? Which is like, you know, for ones, we work so hard. There are parts of me that have been envious of people who work less and still get the same result, <laughs> or perhaps work less and are happier. So to, to like mirror that with all these multiple experiences, the parts of us that are disgusted by things are perhaps attracted to things we need to pay attention to. Yeah. yeah. Right. We need to pay attention to what that says about perhaps us and the work we need to do. And honestly, I, I'm, it has helped me become less competitive and aggressive, aggressive to other business owners that are women. When I've been like, Oh, if I have envy or if I have like, Oh, I feel bad about myself because they're succeeding. That's an invitation for more unity versus scarcity and division and on a more positive frame it's actually a long you know that it's a long yes tunes us into what am i longing for and maybe just to give it a, a personal example is i i have these really wonderful friends we're all like uh one of them i don't know quite as well but we're all pretty close and somewhere <laughs> along the way and we um somewhere along the way they end up regularly they get lunch together, you know, and they talk and like, they pray together. They're like, really, they're, they care for each other. And I was telling one of my friends, I was like, you know, I, I, at times when I hear about that, I get jealous, you know, mm -hmm. really what's going on for me is I long to be in that type of space with other women, you know? So I think that like our jealousy, it's every, everything is grist for the mill, you know? And it's just, how can I actually use oh. my jealousy to tune in and figure out what am I longing and what need is going unmet so that then I can start to like resource some of these things in my life in a, yeah. you know? Absolutely. It's, it's a call to something. It's a call to curiosity. And like you're saying, it's a beautiful reframe. It's a longing, right? Because a longing is like a desire. And then I think parts of ourselves and the way women are also socialized, it's like desire or feelings. You know, they're not thoughts, they're not articulated thoughts, perhaps they're just a felt sense, so then they're automatically discounted. So like all this work we've been talking about just informs other work. Um, yeah, and it is, it is. And I, I'll say, maybe that's also what happened with you when I was posting, like you immediately reached out and were like, oh my gosh, let's talk. And it felt like an invitation and it was in a, a connection and a resonance, of course, right? But I wonder too if there's like a longing to be like, oh, I want to talk to Natasha about this and to share with other people, right? Yeah, I know that's how these beautiful things happen. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> what would we do without the Instagram? I don't even know. I know it's a great way to share information. That's for sure. <laughs> that's true. Well, what about um, just as we're kind of wrapping up, um, sure. you know, maybe if you could just tell us your like Instagram handle. Um, it's gonna, it'll oh, be yeah, I should probably read it out to people. So it's my name, Natasha, but I write it a very specific way because I want it to be simple. Um, so it's Natasha, but it's, uh, there's double A's everywhere. So it's N-A-A-T-A-A-S-H underscore A. So that's my handle. Um, and you and I follow each other and I also follow Optimum Joy. So we'll, people can find me. Yeah, but I do, I do share different things. Like I, I should say I'm in a season of like posting a bunch of slides about particular experience that's personal. Again, like we started with my personal truth that points to systemic issues, systemic things that point to my personal truth. Um, and I'm trying to be more out there in the world in a very different way. So I'm all about connection. Yeah. <laughs> As you have always been, I'm learning that from you. <laughs> Well, here's the thing is, uh, what? I, as a social Enneagram 8, first uh, of all, I have a lot of masculine in me and devalue weakness, so yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I think that mm -hmm. uh, the, social, the, the social subtype that I operate out of is really kind of very um, connection-based, so 
Yeah. Totally. It's the same. So my stacking, and anyone who listens to this will know. So my stacking is the sexual or the one-to-one, the self-pres and the social. So my connections have truly been like me as a lone wolf and then some important small people or small circle in my life. So for you to invite me, I had to do some work to be open on Instagram <laughs> and to think of myself in a social group. Mm-hmm. Not that I did it, but you know what I mean? It's the repressed instinct. And to raise it up of like, let's talk on me, perhaps the one in me is like, let's talk about what's wrong, how to fix it. (laughs) Right. And then how can I do that work? But that's why I'm I'm learning from you. Well, maybe I'll say this as we kind of wrap up is you are in the Western suburbs in the Wheaton Naperville area. And I feel like if anyone's resonating with some of this topic, um, to know that your supervision actually influences the therapists who work in your who I Mm -hmm would be more than willing so evergreen counseling i'm sure they'd be more than willing to look at some of these sy- systems parts work all yep. that. Yeah. Uh, i would absolutely say our, our practices i mean everything that i'm sharing our practice is informed with that um not that i'm forcing on people but like in the creation of this practice i've had again that's my social instinct i'm trying to grow it um it's always been a systemic practice meaning that like we see people in context so not that in, in, an individual can't get care here, but often individuals, we can talk about our own stuff. But the whole, our whole conversation has been like me referencing multi-generational issues, immigrant issues, women's issues, how all of that stuff and how it informs personal work. Um, and and I, I should say our therapists collectively, we regularly meet, we talk about our stuff, right? Like we talk about how it informs our work, how it can be helpful if it's looked at or how perhaps it's a vulnerability if we don't do the work. So yeah, we're very much a practice that, that is, even in our social media, if you look at it, we're, we're being very, very intentional about our identities and who we see and who we want to see. And especially in Pride Month, we're talking about being an affirming practice that still needs to do work, but has done some work and can serve people of the LGBTQ plus um, world. Uh, but yeah, that's what our practice is all about. I'm not definitely unique in this. I'm sure if you had everyone in our practice, they could tell you countless stories about their identity development and then how that helps clients um, because well, that's why we exist. But we don't believe that we can be super unhealthy and give them a product because this work is personal. I'm sure Optimum Joy is the same. I mean, I should say I know it is. <laughs> but yeah, if anyone's curious, they can also reach out to me. I know if people are watching and they just want to email me directly, you can find my information on the website or also our intake coordinator can talk to them but we are a practice that's about intersectionality the enneagram we see a lot of people who are christian different points in that process a lot of people that are just have a faith they want to integrate um yeah that's us well girl i love you you are a beautiful soul and uh Thank you. I I received it. and um uh, i'm so grateful oh same and i'm sure we'll talk soon but thanks for coming on today i oh, really appreciate it Yeah, absolutely. I wish you the best on this wonderful summer weekend. We'll talk again. Yeah, sounds good.